nasz gość specjalny z Kanady. Przywitajmy go prawami, niech poczuje po prostu polską moc. Great, thanks everybody and uh, uh, welcome. Uh, I'll be doing the presentation in English. My Polish is not that great, so uh, sorry about that uh, first and foremost, but I do have a, a great team with me here from... Oh, sorry, okay. That is a problem. I will speak slower because I will be talking in English. So please, uh, Magda, if you have to remind me, please let me know. I'm a bit of a hand talker too, so if you notice the microphone drifting away, let me know that as well. So a uh, bit of background, uh, I'm from the Green Organic Dutchman uh, in Canada. We are a licensed producer of medicinal cannabis and actually recreational cannabis now that we can sell that in Canada. Uh, we will produce this year about 170,000 kilograms of cannabis uh, in Canada, as well as uh, about 15,000 kilograms in Jamaica. Uh, and, and we have a great partner here in, in Poland, uh, Hemp Poland. So they actually have quite a large cultivation of hemp that we don't include in that 170,000 kilogram number. Too fast. Oh, Too fast. sorry guys. Too fast. <laughs> I usually do uh, presentations in America, so it's uh, not, not such an issue or, or in, in, uh, in UK. Uh, Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay, quick background on me, just, just so you guys know where I'm coming from. Uh, I run the corporate development team uh, with my boss over at the Green Organic Dutchman. We're responsible for our international and domestic strategy, and that includes licensing, and it includes mergers and acquisitions, and really a lot of lobbying and education. That's 80% of my job is speaking with governments around the world, and my team is, is traveling around the world daily to lobby governments, to educate them, sorry, to lobby governments and to educate governments on um, how how economically beneficial uh, opening up a cannabis market could be for their governments. Uh, often we're talking about a medical cannabis regime. Uh, most governments around the world are not open to talking about a recreational regime yet. So if we can move in with, with medical cannabis first and kind of create uh, a good economy around that, it's easy to push into recreational in the future if that's what the government wishes. Um, so our team has done some pretty big transactions uh, over the last year and, and it's, a, it's an exciting space in the cannabis space. Uh, Probably, you know, I'm from mergers and acquisitions in my previous career and, and the stuff that we've done in this single year in Canada, I wouldn't do in 25 years in another company. Um, so we did do uh, the partnership and acquisition of Hemp Poland this year, which we're very proud of. Great team uh, here. Uh, we did a joint venture in Jamaica. We have a joint venture in Denmark. Um, we're moving into some other jurisdictions uh, very soon as well. Uh, and we've licensed some great technologies uh, from the USA. Uh, myself, I'm a 20-year cannabis uh, advocate. So before I worked with the Green Organic Dutchman, uh, I had a fairly professional career in finance, but I have been an advocate for the legalization of cannabis for more than 20 years in Canada. Uh, I'm actually a cancer survivor myself, and so I have used cannabis medicinally, and I am a cannabis consumer daily. Um, and so, you know, big part of my job is to create and elevate the industry. Uh, I'm a professional, I'm well educated, I'm married, I have two kids and I think I'm a good father and husband and I'm a daily cannabis consumer and I don't see any issue with that. So one of the big things we try to do is we try to, to change the street level talk and if we can elevate the language around cannabis, it's very easy for people to start accepting it around the world. So, you know, strain names uh, that have AK-47 or Triple X or Thunderfuck. This kind of stuff doesn't fly very easily and, and it's not acceptable by a lot of people. So in Canada, you are seeing people change the strain names. So they're changing them to stuff, stuff that's Blue Calm or Purple Dream and, and stuff that's very consumer friendly and a little bit fluffy, but it is, uh, it's a highly regulated market. Um, a bit of background on what's happening in cannabis uh, in Canada right now uh, to kind of give a primer on this. And, and, and just so you know, this, this talk is going to be a little bit about uh, the wins that have, that have occurred through our recreation or, or, or uh, uh, regulatory rollout process. We've banged our heads in Canada on a couple things too. You don't roll anything out perfect, so there's some misses as well. But I think what that provides is a great uh, opportunity for future jurisdictions to learn, uh, to take best practices, and use Canada as a little bit of a blueprint and kind of tweak where necessary. Um, so we have had a medicinal cannabis regime in Canada for about 14 years. Uh, the one thing that Canada did, which was very smart, uh, we had a fairly conservative government uh, a, few, a few years ago in power. And what they did is they actually opened up a commercial licensing program. So they made it a competitive licensing program that any individual company can apply for. And what that did was create a, a, a huge competition in Canada and it attracted a lot of foreign capital. It, uh, it created a lot of R&D and a lot of investment and a lot of IP. So that was probably one of the smartest moves that we've seen and that would be, you know, maybe in comparison to a country like Italy where the, the, the army in Italy and the, the public government is responsible for cultivation and feeding it through to the, uh, to the public. So it's a very, 
it, it's tough to develop an industry when, when the government is involved that heavily. When you allow the private industry to run with it, you're gonna develop a very robust industry. And so, so that's what one of the good things that the government did years ago and allowed that to kind of go. Um, what happened on October 17th was we legalized recreational cannabis. Um, and we didn't legalize everything. We're pretty restrictive and our medical regime were restrictive too. So what you can purchase in both the medical uh, markets and the recreational markets are dried cannabis flowers, uh, are pre-rolled cannabis uh, cigarettes, and very simple oils. So m similar to most of the CBD oils that you would see here where it's just a carrier and, and uh, the cannabinoids. And we're not allowed right now to put in anything fancy. We're not allowed to put in any, any other synergistic botanical elements, anything that would uh, increase the efficiency of the THC or the cannabinoids. It's just a very simple oil right now. Um, we have no concentrates for sale in the Canadian uh, legal market, and we have no edibles or beverages or topicals or vape cartridges. It's really a very, very narrow kind of sector. The issue there is that we have a very robust black market in Canada and there's a lot of dispensaries and you can go to the black market and you can purchase very good branded CPG products in any delivery method you can think of from chocolate bars to hot chocolate to I saw beef jerky infused with THC in one of the dispensaries the other day. So the, the government of Canada and most governments around the world, they care about two things. They care about when, when you talk about legalizing cannabis, they care about protecting the children and they care about taking uh, converting the black market to a legal market so they can tax it. Uh, and depending on, on which government's in power uh, and, and what their kind of mandate is, stuff happens in different ways. So our government cares more right now about protecting the children. They're very, that's very much the mandate. So what they've done is they created this phase one legalization where we have a very narrow product offering available. And then within a year, we expect to have a much more wide product availability. So we will have beverages, we will have you know, chewable gums, maybe gummy bear type candies, like all kinds of infused products will be available at that time. The issue and why that takes longer to happen is, is those products are inherently more dangerous. Uh, there's a lot of more regulation around it about product safety, product efficacy. Um, so the government is going to uh, roll that out more slowly. The issue is that that does not help with uh, detracting from black market sales. When you don't offer the products that the consumers want, they go purchase them from the black market. And actually the black market's thriving right now because you can purchase all of these products that will be legal in phase two. You can purchase them currently in the black market. And that's what a lot of consumers want. They like their vape cartridges. It's safer, or, you know, safer delivery method. Uh, they want nice capsules that some people want teas and chocolates and, and topicals actually. Just a very simple topical, you still cannot buy a, a salve or a balm that's infused with a cannabinoid in Canada legally. Um, and I'll just say too, in Canada, CBD and THC are treated exactly the same still. So they are both considered the same, they're on the same narcotic schedule. It's quite a bit different than uh, in the EU where CBD is highly unregulated. C even CBD from industrial hemp is still treated the exact same as THC in Canada, and you would require a doctor's prescription to, to access it in a medical market, or you would have to buy it through the, the legal recreational sales channels to be able to acquire it. This is just a quick overview of uh, kind of the recreational opportunities in Canada. Uh, I think a, a couple points to note is that the population of Canada is very similar to Poland. So we are 37 million people in Canada. I think it's 38 in, in around in Poland right now. Uh, and the Canadian dollar is, I think uh, one Canadian dollar is in around three Polish dollars. I think it's 2.85. So these are all Canadian dollar numbers, but you can see we're looking at, as you look at the base market, which is the population and how much they're going to use, just for purchasing at the retail side, we're, you know, between five and kind of nine billion dollars. So that's, that would be between, you know, 15 and, and 20, 27 million Polish, Polish dollars on the retail. And then when you kind of bring in all the other contract manufacturers, the testing, the security, all the auxiliary businesses that are helping to, to build up the, the industry. You know, you're looking at between 13 and, and 20, 23 billion dollars Canadian uh, a year generated in the economy. And then when you start to consider cannabis tourism, uh, business taxes, licensing fees, uh, other kind of paraphernalia, you're looking at an industry that, you know, could grow to very quickly 20, 23 billion dollars uh, in very short order. Um, so that's kind of, that's the recreational side. And, and just as a heads up, we, we assume that the, the medical market is about a tenth the size of, of the recreational market in Canada. So this is recreational numbers. If you were to divide that by 10, that's about the size that you'd expect for the medical. Who's the biggest winner? 
This is a, you know, this is a lobbying thing. So the biggest winner is the government. Uh, everybody thinks that the, all these publicly traded companies that I work for, great company, we've raised 400, 450 million dollars to date. You know, we're going to make a lot of money. The biggest winner is the government, uh, by far. In fact, uh, I believe in the first two days of legalization of recreational cannabis, the government raked in more money than the last three years of the, the entire medical regime, and it's it kind of mind blowing. And so this is a report from CIBC. Uh, CIBC is a big bank in Canada. I think they're the fourth largest bank. And, and even that's kind of telling. We now have large institutional banks covering the cannabis sector, covering cannabis stocks. It's, it's not you know, back, backroom analyst. This is, this is one of the leading banks in Canada covering the cannabis space. And they said, you know, provinces uh, within, uh, so from October 17th to December 31st, uh, 2019, uh, you know, provinces, uh, and in Canada we have provinces, they're like states in the United States. Uh, they're going to generate over $3 billion of income from taxes or profits uh, because the provinces actually own a lot of the retail distribution and the retail uh, sales stores. Um, and by far, they're the biggest winners. Uh, it looks like about 70% of the profits are going to accrete back to, to the government. And you know, that, that's always favorable if you're trying to push a new regime forward. You have to show the economic impact. So producers you see down here will sell maybe $3.60 a gram. If you're looking at a $10 gram, you know, the producers may be selling in at $3.60 into the government retail channel. The government, so the provinces, they are the distributor, so they get that $2 markup and they effectively, some, some of the provinces don't actually even handle the product. Uh, we would ship it directly to the retailer and it's just a paper trail for the province and then they take that markup automatically. Uh, in, I think, eight of the, the 13 uh, jurisdictions in Canada, the government also owns the retailer. Uh, in, in some of our provinces, we have uh, private retail, so I could go and open a, a retail recreational cannabis shop, but in most of the provinces, those recreational cannabis shops are owned by the government. So the government's taking that distribution fee, the government's taking the retailer fee, and the government's taking the, the sales tax and the excise tax on it too. And so significant, significant revenue generation for the government. Other big wins, there, there's a lot of wins going on. Uh, job creation has been huge in Canada. So last year at the end, and I haven't seen the numbers for 2018 yet, but we had about 2,400 employees in the cannabis sector actually working, and that's uh, working for companies like mine who are licensed, not actually considering any of the auxiliary businesses. I would venture that that's you know, probably 15 to 20 times higher right, when we get the 2018 numbers. Um, it, it's amazing. And so one big report we read said, you know, probably in about five to seven years, there'll be 150,000 uh, jobs in the cannabis space in Canada, which is it's a pretty big. Um, one, of the, the, one of the better stories, I guess, is uh, Canopy Growth. Uh, they're the largest probably cannabis producer in Canada by far. Um, we had a, a, a town in Canada called Smith Falls, uh, Hershey's Chocolate used to have a big factory there. Uh, and this factory employed about 25% of the city. Uh, Hershey's decided to close that factory down and it was a defunct factory for about 10 years. Uh, Canopy came in and bought it, converted it into a grow facility. Uh, and now they employ 800 people in that city and they're doing hiring fairs every week across the country to bring in more people. So about 9% of the town's working in that facility now and it's up and running uh, and they're driving tourism to there too. So that city was, was after the Hershey factory closed, it was in real economic depression for you know quite a while. This really picked the city back up and they've actually seen the real estate prices on their homes skyrocket because they have so many new, new employees coming into the city looking for homes. So that's been great. Uh, we've also seen the introduction of several new college programs and university programs. These are programs related to greenhouse technology, cultivation of cannabis, R&D on cannabinoids, very cannabis specific stuff. And the demand for these young people coming out of school is so severe that when we go to the hiring fairs at the colleges, we are only allowed to take one person from each program because there's about 130 licensed producers in Canada and the demand is huge. So we'll go in and the college will say, sure, you can talk to everybody in our program, but you're only allowed to take one. And it's, it's that, that tight right now. So for the youth, it's great. Like there's a, a whole new industry, a whole new opportunity. You have really excited uh, young people coming up uh, with, with new opportunities for work. And beyond that, you have skilled professionals. I said myself, you know, my background's in finance and accounting for, for over 13 years, and I worked for the Department of National Defense as well for about four years. Um, we have our CEO was a Procter & Gamble executive for 25 years and ran all Eastern European and Asian operations. Uh, all, all, most of our, our senior executives are from the consumer packaged goods space and very, very successful there. So this is... Uh, 
It, the, one of the fall, uh, the cool things is that you're getting industry professionals, and actually a lot of people who are retired are, are kind of coming into the cannabis space because they see an opportunity to really uh, put a feather in the hat of their career and, and create a legacy. One of the downfalls is that the, the government's been pretty restrictive on allowing you to bring in black market participants into the, the legal market. Um, and, and so that's, I guess that slowed the... The industry and the growers are banging their heads a little bit on stuff because we're pretty restrictive on being able to bring in black market growers or people who have experience from the black market with extraction. So it's almost like everybody's starting over again and that becomes very difficult. Uh, they're starting to change the rules a little bit now where we, we are allowed to bring in some people that have maybe criminal records from the black market, but it's, it's still highly restrictive. Um, and the truth is, is those people in the black market, they have the best skills. They know how to grow, they know how to extract, they've been doing it for years. In Canada, they are the, they're the best. And so it's tough when you can't bring them in. Um, the other you know, big win is that we've attracted a ton of money into Canada, and most of the money that's coming into Canada is being invested back into Canada. Now we're starting to see a lot of that money more recently go overseas, but at the start, absolutely. And I, I bet you there's, from my last look, there's probably about $1.2 billion worth of cannabis construction happening in Canada right now. Uh, I know we're doing $350 million of greenhouses ourselves, or three, somewhere in around there, uh, and there's several other big, big facilities going up. Uh, the other kind of cool thing is that we're starting to see more traditional forms of financing and debt come through. So as I mentioned, the big banks are starting to play now. For a long time they didn't, and now we have big institutional money coming in, big institutional analysts following our companies, and we're also being offered traditional debt at, at reasonable, low-risk business prices, which was unheard of even a year ago. So it's, it's, it's quite cool. Uh, and it's also providing a real, real... Um, it's creating a real hub for cannabis innovation and IP in Canada. Uh, and Canada being a small country, you know, we don't get an opportunity to be a world leader very often. And when we have that opportunity, we're gonna run with it. And we're, we're quite proud that we have this opportunity right now. Uh, the Americans are catching up pretty quick, but uh, you know, we got a good, we got a good head start. Um, and we're starting to see, and this is one of the benefits in Canada anyways, is that we're starting to see a lot of money pushed into research from universities, from um, nonprofit institutions like cancer centers, uh, the Center for Mental Health, the Center for addictions, they're funding significant amount, amount of research into cannabis right now. And so that's going to be quite a big win. Uh, this kind of follows on to that. I think, you know, you have to understand that cannabis is going to be commoditized very, very quickly. Right now the margins are huge. Uh, and, and what that actually allows us to do is reinvest some of that money into creating great technologies so that in the future, when it does, when half a cent or a penny per gram matters, because it will, um, you know, we'll be there. And so what we do is we go around and we look for, you know, the best technologies in big agriculture and we try to apply them into cannabis so that we can be automated, whether that's AI or, you know, full automation. And in addition to that, we're kind of inventing uh, in the industry a lot of our own technologies now, again, because we have some excess money in the early years. And those technologies are being transferred over to the agriculture sector, uh, the traditional agriculture sector. And it's really helping to pick up the, the, the overall agriculture sector in Canada with these new innovative technologies that somebody who's growing tomatoes or cucumbers would never really have the money or wherewithal to invest in and, and really trial and figure it out. So it's real, you know, multi-benefits uh, multi there. Um, the clinical research is, is big. So, uh, you know, right now you make money selling cannabis and, and you, you have to be, uh, in Canada, you have to be pretty bad at it not to make money. Like, it, you know, it, it's, it is what it is. Uh, in, in time that will change. Uh, and so I think as cannabis commoditizes, as the market, you know, gets more flooded with supply, uh, IP becomes the most important thing. And whether that's brand IP or whether that's, you know, patented formulations for cancer treatment or for MS or for Parkinson's, you know, that becomes the most valuable. Uh, and, and we're starting to see that already where, where we're exporting greenhouse, cannabis greenhouse technologies around the world. Uh, we're providing consulting services to firms around the world, governments around the world, uh, providing genetics and SOPs. And so Canada's already exporting that IP around there. And so we're generating revenue from selling cannabis, but we're also generating significant revenues and, and royalties and licensing fees from exporting IP, which is, which is always a big win for a country. Uh, this is actually, I think this just came out, you know, last week, and this is from the New York Times, and it was actually, it's quite a good article, but, uh, you know, it just talks about how the, the hands are off. Uh, in the USA, you know, uh, they've been really restricted on cannabis research other than one university down there for, you know, a better part of 100 years. Uh, our handcuffs came off in Canada last year pretty aggressive. A few years ago it came off, but it really started last year. Uh, and it's, 
It's amazing. Uh, we saw that I think the Canadian government in the last five years has invested $20 million into several different, uh, into funding several different R&D uh, projects. Uh, and I believe that they're looking to fund uh, another 20 million over the next few years. And that's, you know, that's just the government funding and we have a lot of private funding happening too. Uh, and so they care about, they care about the stuff that the politicians care about. They care about stuff that moms care about. They care about stuff that society cares about. So they're going to look into questions like how much can you smoke and, and until you drive and how long should you wait and actually do the blood tests and figure that stuff out. You know, what age should you, you cut off for, for uh, teenagers using it? In Canada, in some of our provinces, you can consume cannabis at 18 and in other provinces at 21, right? So there's a big debate and we have actually one province that's trying to make it 25. And it's a lot of anecdotal evidence out there right now, right? And so when you can start to fund the actual research, that anecdotal evidence turns into black and white science, and you've really elevated and moved the industry forward. And that, that, that becomes quite, quite exciting. Um, the biggest miss in Canada, and I don't know if anybody's familiar with Canada, but we have an immense amount of illegal dispensaries. They, they are brick and mortar retail stores and a huge, huge uh, online marketplace for cannabis. It's very good quality. It's very cheap. The customer service is amazing. It's branded very well. It gets delivered to your door in like two days for a third the price as the legal product. Um, it's, 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 it's an issue right now. Um, and, and what happened is that the black market players have been very good at creating confusion, and not just confusion in consumers. We have the media, and like the biggest media companies in Canada often write articles and include dispensaries in them, assuming that these dispensaries are legal avenues to purchase cannabis, and, and they're not. Uh, the police in Canada, it's a little violent in, in Canada. We have a big problem with guns and violence right now. So the police have decided, you know what, we have bigger priorities. We're gonna, we're gonna get guns off the street. We're gonna take gangs off the street. These dispensaries aren't hurting anybody, so they, they just kind of turn a blind eye and allow them to continue to operate. Um, in addition to that, the online sales channels, uh, our police forces in Canada, we have local police, provincial police, and then federal police, and the three of them are all very disconnected, and none of them can agree on who, whose job it is to fight the online channels. Uh, so that's a huge issue right now. We're trying to, we're trying to deal with that. Um, you know what? Uh, I talk a little bit later on about why this happened, but I, the, the main reason is that our government came into power, uh, they announced that they were going to legalize cannabis, and then it took them about 18 months to do that. And so before they made that announcement, there was only one or two kind of dispensaries in all of Canada, very medical focused, like very, very medical focused. You're not gonna be able to go in there as a recreational user and buy cannabis. As soon as the government made that announcement, and in, in those 18 months until October 17th, when they actually legalized cannabis, the proliferance of dispensaries and online stuff was crazy. There's the, in my town, I think there's 40 dispensaries. In Toronto, there's about 120. Uh, and in, again, online ones, anywhere you can find them. So within that 18 month period, uh, nobody really knew what happened. The government had said, we're legalizing it. It's not quite legal yet though. And it created this kind of void uh, and it allowed this to kind of happen. And now they're trying to reverse that. So, you know, you gotta be, dis if you're going to roll legislation out, you have to be quick and decisive and very clear about it because the confusion is not just with consumers, the, consum the confusion's with the police, the confusion's with the media, the confusion's with the politicians. Like Canadian politicians don't understand what's going on. And a lot of them think the dispensaries are legal avenues that they can purchase at. It's, uh, the government, that's been a, a little bit of a, uh, the, the miss, I say. And again, you know, I think they've done a pretty good job, but nothing's going to be perfect. We're the first country after Uruguay to really roll out on large scale, and you're going to bump your head on things. So that was, in my opinion, what I think we bumped our head on the most. This is an article from at the end of August, and it basically says what I was just talking about. And, and there's a lot of articles like this in Canada right now. Um, I ordered cannabis from the online legal legal online store in Ontario. Uh, the first day it was legalized on October 17th. Uh, it got delivered to my house on November 16th, I think, something like that. It took a month to get there. Uh, it cost me three times the price of the black market stuff. Um, the stuff was very dry and it didn't smell good. I think it had been in a vault for a very long time. Um, so we're, we're having issues with that. There has been mold found on a couple, not on T-God products. T-God's actually not selling in the recreational market yet. There's a couple players in Canada that had mold on their, their stuff. And, and there's a bit of arrogance in Canada that, um, there's a little bit of, cor I'll be honest, there's a little bit of corporate arrogance that thinks uh, the black market's low quality, you know, they don't know what they're doing, and, and that's more of a corporate mentality, when the truth is that, you know, the black market in Canada is very customer focused, they make great product, they've been doing it for a very long time, uh, and, you know, to, to kind of just put them down like that, it, it's, 
it doesn't doesn't work very well. So we've actually um, we're we're trying to change that mentality. And now that they're allowing some black market players to participate or at least be hired and help out, uh, hopefully that will change. Um, but you know, this is we've been legal for a month and a half, so the growing pains, right? And they think it'll be about six months before um, the supply can actually start to satisfy the demand in the country. So we do have a lot of the legal, the legal government-run dispensaries are uh, opening two days a week now because they just don't have supply uh, enough. So that that was you know one of the one of the issues. They rolled it out quick. So what kind of lessons can you learn uh, from this? Is is a, I think, I'll, I'll talk about number two first, is exactly what I said. You've got to be quick and decisive on regulations. Don't, don't give it time for the black market to flourish. Don't create that gap and that gray zone because players understand how to manipulate that, and if they can get entrenched, it's tough. The black market players in Canada are very, very entrenched. We're talking about people with like hundreds of thousands of Facebook followers. The leading black market vape maker in Canada does $10 million a year of sales. The leading black market topical provider in Canada does $9 million of sales a year. Like these are big, large companies with huge advertising budgets. Uh, when you go to the big conferences in Canada, in fact, these black market brands have the biggest booths. And if you were to walk through, you would never know that they're illegal. They have huge, gorgeous booths, all of them. It's, it's, it's amazing. And it, that further creates the confusion. It's, uh, it, it's wild. Um, so one thing that Canada did, and we bumped our head on this a bit, is that we set up our regime as GPP, which is it's just a production practice. It's a goods production practice. Because Canada was looking at a future rec market, they were okay with that. The issue, though, is that Every, everywhere in the world's a medical market. It needs to be GMP certified for cannabis or you're not able to get it into that market. Uh, the Canadian government will not certify cannabis GMP, so you have most Canadian players looking at, at uh, overseas, usually Germany, uh, to get GMP certified. So I say just, you know, move into GMP certification and require it immediately. Uh, Canada kind of dropped the ball on that one. Um, one of the issues right now is that uh, previously, even a year ago, there was very few global opportunities. There was, you know, I could list on my one hand opportunities that I could go and invest in cannabis and to build a greenhouse or try to get a license or distribute product. That's changing every week. That's changing like two times a week almost. And, and there's new jurisdictions coming on every day. Uh, and now there's a lot of opportunities. And, and for, for jurisdictions to attract foreign investment, they need to be very clear on what their regulations are uh, and, and, you know, favorable regulations. So we're seeing regulations change all the time. Down in California, I think they've changed their pesticide regulations about 18 times. Um, but, you know, be clear on whether you're going to allow outdoor growing or not. Companies not, are not going to go into a country and invest $100 million to build a greenhouse if you're going to allow their neighbor to cultivate outdoors. Uh, and so we kind of, people want to understand those. One of the issues that we're having right now is some jurisdictions are very, very focused on trying to create all the economic benefit within their country. So they want you to cultivate and basically be vertically integrated within the country. Cultivate, manufacture your product, and then uh, sell your final product uh, or I guess package and sell your final product uh, as well. Whereas other jurisdictions are much more open to a, a kind of an integrated global supply chain where I can you know, grow cannabis in Canada, and, I, and this is all medical related, grow cannabis in Canada, maybe send it to Germany, have it packaged into soft gels or capsules, uh, and then export those capsules around the world. Uh, I think in the future, you know, it looks like big cannabis will look like Pfizer, like Procter & Gamble. You know, we'll have a facility maybe in Europe or two facilities that do capsules. We'll have one or two facilities uh, elsewhere in the world that do beverages. We'll have another facility that does creams and topicals, another one that does cosmetics. To force a big global company to do all of that in one country and, and produce all of those final products in one country, it doesn't make sense and it's going to delay investment decisions. And so, you know, we deal with this every day. I want to be able to have free movement of my medicinal cannabis around and so that I can ship it to Thailand if I have a facility there to make something. Uh, and so that's just one of the things we're seeing where some countries like Greece, for example, is coming out a little bit more restrictive where they want all final products to be produced in the country. And then you have other countries like a Denmark or Portugal that are very, very happy to export bulk products anywhere. Um, companies like us, we want to see, we don't want to see forced vertical integration. It doesn't make sense in a mature industry. And then I think the last thing that, that we're learning quickly in Canada is that this is a medical market. Like it's in, we have recreational market in Canada and that's what it is. Globally, it's a medical market. Uh, and you always got to treat the, the, consider the medical patients. Uh, in Canada, they've actually decided to tax 
the medical, uh, medical marijuana for medical patients. So no other pharmaceutical product in Canada is taxed. They decided to tax cannabis, which is very unfair, and there's a huge lobby about it. Um, it's effectively telling, their concern is that non-medical users will purchase medical product and not to, to avoid the taxes. It's, it's so convoluted, but, uh, and the medical product is much more expensive than the rec product, so it just doesn't make sense. Um, but I think that will change, but it's, it's created a real animosity. Um, also, when recreational, uh, because rec was happening, what we've seen recently is a, a huge supply deficit for medical patients. So in the last two or three weeks in Canada, there's been a lot of, uh, lot of complaints that medical patients can't get the strain or the supply they need or the oils they need because companies are just pushing it all through to the rec market to build brand awareness and stuff like that now. The truth is in Canada, you want to sell to the medical market. Your margin is huge. I showed the other graph where the government's taking 70% of my profits when I sell to the recreational market. In the medical market, I sell direct to the patient and the government takes an excise tax. I get that whole margin. So as a producer, we are absolutely medical first and we'll sell as much into the medical market as we can. But there's other players and some of the big guys, they just want to get their brand out there in the market and this created a real supply deficiency for, for the medical players. Um, one of the other things that I think is useful in Canada that they do is... Uh, uh, in most jurisdictions, it's hard to find a doctor who's familiar with cannabis, and even if the doctor is familiar with cannabis, that is willing to prescribe it. It's the biggest issue in Canada. It's still a huge, huge issue. Uh, so if there's provisions around telemedicine, uh, we have telemedicine in, in Jamaica and Canada both, where you can have an iPad and you can connect to a doctor. It makes it very useful. Uh, it makes it useful for people who live in rural areas that maybe have one doctor in 100 square kilometers. Uh, and it also makes it useful for people who, who are very ill and can't get out of the house. And it also just it makes it easy because you can have the, the, a doctor who's familiar with cannabis on telemedicine and can deal with most of the people. So that's, that's quite good. Uh, and then in Canada, we actually had a pretty big win because, as I just said, we sell directly to patients. So patients will register with us on our website when they have a prescription. They will order and we will mail it directly to the patient. In the medical market, that's the only legal way to purchase it in Canada. Uh, it's actually been quite good. Um, I think the German model, you know, it creates a little bit of a burden uh, for the pharmacies. The, I know pharmacies have to do a lot of testing of the product before they sell it to patients. And it also creates a big burden for the doctors and prescription writers when, uh, if that product is not available, about the pharmacy, it can be tough to fill the prescription. The prescription can go void. You have to get the prescription rewritten. It creates a big tax burden for, for, for the, the state as well. Um, so I, I like the Canadian model where we are selling direct to patients and we're not dealing with any of that kind of cumbersome uh, issues in between. Um, that's about my presentation. I'm happy. I don't know what the time's like, Magda, but I could take questions uh, if there's time. Yeah, 50 minutes. 50, okay. Yeah. Where can we get data and results of clinical trials on various medical uh, marijuana usage from neurological and neurological? Yeah, um, so th this is the issue right now is that the, the, that research isn't out there yet. There's some. There, Israel's been pretty good at it. Canada's starting to do the research as well. You have some very uh, early results. Um, in fact, if you want to take my business card and email, email, email you, the Health Canada has a list on their website, and it's a, a, a page that they created for doctors. And what it is is it effectively a scrub of all the clinical data to date on cannabis and how it relates to each indication, whether it's MS or Crohn's disease or Parkinson's or neurological issues. Um, and that's right now the biggest database. On our side, one of the most exciting things, I think, will be when you can start to bring in um, kind of like IBM has that Watson drug discovery, the, the kind of AI issue, and it can scrub about 30 million medical journals at once, and you can type in a couple things. That stuff will start to happen. You'll start to really be able to connect the dots together and create formulations. But right now, there's, there's not a lot of good info out there. And, that, and that, in fact, that's why uh, there's only one... Uh, one true, I guess, pharmaceutical cannabis product in the globe right now, and that's GW Pharma's Epodex, right? Everything else, is, that's a CBD product made from real plant. Everything else is made from synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, that is the only product that's gone through, I think, phase three clinical trials and is uh, approved for sale as a true uh, RX pharmacy drug. In Canada, we don't, uh, they're, they're uh, pharmaceuticals, but they're not clinically trialed, if that makes sense. Second. Yeah. Okay. In jurisdictions where cannabis for recreation and for medical is more restricted, the prices are higher and the black market is even more flourishing. Given that goods one way or another can flow throughout the world relatively easily, do you really think that any government or jurisdiction 
can regulate uh, the distribution of either medical or, or recreational. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. And so what you first want to do on the, within your own jurisdiction, I think, is you want to make sure uh, that, that you have good conversion rates. And, and I don't think you're going to see the black market convert to the white market overnight. It takes time. In Colorado, we saw, I think when they first started, it was around 70% of people still purchasing from the black market. Four years on, I think it's about 30% or maybe 15% are, are purchasing from the black market. A lot of it has to do, do with pricing. Uh, and if you can incorporate the black market into the legal market, it doesn't become such an issue. Uh, I think governments can, I think they can control distribution uh, in, in the future. Right now, it's tough though, yeah. I don't know if that answered it appropriately or not. So you're, you're optimistic that there will be a national and global control of the movement of... Yeah, oh well there already is a global control, right? So the UN Narcotics Convention uh, effectively controls the movement of medicinal cannabis and it, and it uh, gives countries quota systems. Uh, so each country every year has a quota uh, about what they're allowed to produce. Uh, and uh, you know, that, that calculation is effectively domestic production, um, less domestic demand, uh, plus imports should equal zero. Uh, and they want to make sure that you don't have a, a, a huge surplus in your country in any one year because they're very concerned, the UN, that that will be pushed into uh, black, black market channels. Um, so Canada is kind of offside with that right now because that's a, a UN medical rule. Uh, producing recreational cannabis is offside with the UN convention, point blank. Yeah. If the movement of cocaine that Pablo Escobar was doing 20 years ago has not at all been diminished, and then it's totally illegal mm -hmm. from the producing countries to the, to the transit countries mm -hmm. and the consuming countries, can you really expect that cannabis will be regulated effectively? Uh, I think it will. Uh, I think it'll take time. It absolutely will take time. And, and any time that you can have a black market that can compete on price and quality, uh, then it's going to be tough to stamp it out. Uh, I don't think you're going to see a war on drugs, on cannabis, and that kind of stuff. But what you will see, and in Canada, what, what the play will be, I think, is that um, licensed producers are forced to be certified. Uh, they're forced to, um, you, you know that you're not feeding money to a gang. Uh, we were forced to provide COAs, so you know what pesticides or other chemicals might be in the product. Um, that way you're creating consumer trust, I think. Uh, I do think the black market product is very, very good quality. Um, but when you can show patients and consumers that, hey, this is much safer, you know, we have a HACCP certification, we have GMP certification, standard kind of uh, food kind of grade certifications, uh, it becomes easier and trusting. I think also... Um, when you start to look at the new verticals of cannabis, so in Canada, there's a certain amount of people who consume cannabis and have consumed cannabis for a long time. They're gonna to continue to probably consume it the way they did, whether that's through black market sources or not. It's a lot of the new people coming in, the new medical patients, the new recreational users. Those people have never been to the black market and they're probably not going to start purchasing it from the black market. Uh, we've done quite a few surveys and it does show, in Canada anyways, that people are willing to pay a bit of a premium uh, for legal product just because they feel safer about that. And when you do f tell people those stories, right, like nobody wants to be funneling money to Pablo Escobar's gang that's decapitating and kidnapping people or funneling money into you know uh, Afghanistan to help feed you know the war there and stuff so when you can walk that through to people it becomes you know you want to make sure that your money is, is helping good sources that your product is of good quality and that it's certified that story has to be told though right but as you said uh, the US market is quite far away from uh, satisfying the demand in Canada mm -hmm. uh, like four or five days ago the first shipment of it's business, yeah, hundred percent business. So they'll just uh, people will want to. So that was Aurora. Aurora is a partner of ours as well. Um, they. Uh, want to create global distribution uh, and the amounts that they would be sending into the Czech Republic would be very small com compared to the other demand. It's more about creating, uh, creating a name in that market and getting product into the market. Uh, and right now, if you were to look at kind of the value for a licensed producer, the first is, is export. If you could sell it in a European market, the prices are way, way higher than we get in Canada. Second, if you can sell it to medical patients, you're capturing all that margin. And then your kind of worst case is you're selling it into the rec market where you're allowing the government to take, you know, all your profits effectively. Yeah. 
After three years of legalized medical cannabis in Illinois, where I have a license, there are 24,000 licensed cannabis medical users. Mm -hmm. It is estimated that there are over 2 million recreational users. The price of the equivalent medical product that I use is $20 a gram at the dispensary, mm -hmm. and Tyrone delivers it to your house for eight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Canada's the same. So my, my recreational order uh, was uh, 30 grams or something, and it was probably 14 bucks a gram or something like that. From the online channels, it's 350, including delivery. So it's, it's massive. It's a massive difference. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about the vertical integration uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, in Britain, Canada, how do you see Poland as, uh, as your investment part? How do you see the, the biggest obstacles or the biggest chances here? Yeah, so uh, we entered Poland on an industrial hemp uh, CBD kind of play, which is a little bit of a different market. Uh, we, we th as, as I was saying earlier, CBD and THC are treated exactly the same in Canada, so you have to have the same prescription. They're much less regulated in Europe, uh, and it's a great opportunity for us to come in and, and uh, partner with a really well-known brand who's creating, I think, the best probably CBD oil in Europe, if not the globe, uh, and really bring that brand out through Europe. And what that does for, for us is it helps us to get distribution channels, sales channels, and a lot of these markets where CBD is allowed right now, but where THC is banned. So it allows us to get brand presence kind of marketing out there as well. Uh, we would have intention to, um, if the market opens up in Poland, uh, you know, we would very much be interested in exploring cultivation of medicinal cannabis at that time too, uh, and we're always exploring importation opportunities. Uh, right now, there's very little, uh, there's very little uh, ability to import into Poland. We're exploring aggressively, but you know, we would hope to set up a big operation here as well when when regulations allowed allowed to do so. Well, what usually happens? Yeah. Yeah. And also, I think that you are close to the whole production is basically not on the monoculture but clonoculture, and it deprives people of varieties of of the product. And you're basically monopolizing the product based on the governmental restriction that eventually is going to fail. Because I think that the cannabis is a plant that uh, sort of uh, in encourages users to question authority. And you don't take into consideration any cultural value of cannabis, but only value in monetary terms. Uh, I, would dis I, I would disagree. I think some, some players are. Uh, like that, I think we, we care a lot. We are one of the or only organic certified players. We invest heavily into our local community as well as in, into Jamaica too. Uh, as for the import, I, I agree. Most markets, when they open up first, they open up for importation because it takes time to build the capacity. So m most markets around the globe, you're talking usually about three years of importation before you have domestic capacity and production that can support the local market. The play is always to have local production. For us, we want to have local production in that market for flour. If we're converting it into other CPG type of products where there's a lot of, a lot of work to create that value add, that we might ship around. Um, but for medical markets, the goal would be to produce in country when you can produce in country. But that, there's always a lag between when a patient is allowed it by regulations versus when licenses are issued. And we see it around the world, right? Germany, there's no provision to grow in Germany right now. So they're forced to import. They will be continually forced to import probably for the next three or four years. Um, it's, you know, it is the way it is. Is it is is which legal? Yeah, yeah. You're allowed in. Sorry. Uh, every province is you're allowed as a, an individual because we have the recreational legalization now. You are allowed to grow. So they, they, some provinces are six plants. Some provinces are four. Um, but that actually that was a Supreme Court uh, thing. Uh, there are two that are trying to disallow it. That's up against the Supreme Court right now because it was actually a right granted by the Supreme Court that individuals can grow their own cannabis. So the provinces were, we'll see what happens. Quebec and Manitoba are trying to disallow it, but I don't, I don't think that'll go through. Well, I don't want to get into person discussing, but <laughs> I think that uh, if 
before the legalization, there was four criminal charges against Mirwan. Right now, from what I understand, it's about four to seven. So it's actually legalization, it's a monopolization of the production, made Mirwan actually more illegal and more punishable than it, it, before. Yeah, well, they, they put a lot more restrictions on black market growing, for sure. Uh, and I think the, 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 the prison sentence now is, I think, 14 years for illegal growing and illegal selling. Yeah, I don't think it's a monopoly, though. We have 130 licenses in Canada. It's a competitive system, and we have a micro-licensing system, too. So we have people that are growing in, uh, like, 10 square meters and are licensed and growing in the legal market. So they are starting to do that. We have micro-cultivation and micro-processing. So you can also be a micro-extractor. Uh, that, it's very early in that industry, so they, these people aren't fully licensed and coming in yet. The regulations allow it, though. So Canada's a fully competitive market. It's not a, not a monopoly. Canada's maybe monopolizing the world, I would agree on that, but within our own market, we're 37 million people and there's 130 cannabis producers. It's pretty, so how you know. Because it takes time, right? So it takes time to build these facilities. They, you, you don't build a greenhouse overnight, so you gotta raise your money, you gotta build it, you gotta plant your plants, you gotta harvest them, right? It that stuff takes time. So it is an industrialization of the growth. It's not what you would call an agriculture. You know, I, I, as a producer, cannot really invest a million dollars in the greenhouses. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the whole world is going into uh, a food production based on catalogs. What quality what we do have in the places like Canada, the, the actual the variety of the plants itself, uh, the diversity of the genetic material, uh, I, I would disagree. I'd say uh, we have a genetic breeding facility. Uh, I know we have over, right now, 70 unique strains in Canada. Uh, in our Jamaican operation, we have probably about 150 unique strains, uh, and we're continually crossbreeding and creating new strains every day. In fact, that's one of our biggest things is we are trying to find the land race strains and then kind of cross up in, into there so we can make one that generates more CBD or other secondary metabolite generation better. So we're we're, I, I don't think there'll be a lack. On the corporate, the big scale side, you'll probably see these million square foot facilities grow five strains, that kind of thing. You won't see them grow 100 strains at once. But within the market, there will be, there's significant genetics in the market and, and there's a lot of R&D going into creating very robust genetics. Genetics that are resistant to powdery mildew, maybe that branch out and create better secondary metabolites. There's a lot. Uh, our, our VP of growing uh, is a, has a master of science in organic, uh, organic agriculture uh, and works very closely and used to run the, the greenhouse at McGill University, which is the leading agriculture school in Canada. He's an amazing geneticist and uh, I don't think that'll be an issue in the Canadian market. No. Okay. Okay, thank you.